Hey, everybody. It's the Drive School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, David Dezils, my good friend. You are back. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Good. Uh, we've been talking deconstruction. We, we talked about what to do if you're deconstructing, if, if your friend is deconstructing. But let's maybe start to actually walk through some of the the struggles that, that sort of come, come along with it. Uh, you, you, you talked to me before we started recording about some myths that a lot of people sort of wrestle with as they're, as they're going through these, these uh, deconstruction phases. Um, what's the first one and how do we start to, to deal with it? Yeah, so the way I, I think about healthy deconstruction is that you're finding parts of your faith that really don't belong and you're replacing them with something more mature. Um, and I think there are a lot of ideas that get talked about in American Christianity, including the LCMS sometimes. Maybe they don't get stated, but they can be implied by the way we emphasize things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can lead people to have a misunderstanding of God's heart and God's truth around certain issues. And sometimes wrestling with deconstruction is realizing, oh, this thing that I thought was biblical really isn't. Um, I think of um, something Tim Keller said once, which is an, a useful question to ask your non-Christian friends is tell me about the God you don't believe in, because yeah. maybe I don't believe in him either. Right. And, and so I want to spend some time doing that, talking about gods we don't actually believe in and things that can sound Christian and can... Um, seem like truth but they really aren't but the problem is if you believe they're true they can really cause problems for you and they can cause this tension because you think this doesn't fit with reality um so the first one i think and i think i've felt this in a lot of lcms churches the way the preaching emphasizes certain things it can sound like christianity is just fire insurance so say more uh, yeah. So, so fire insurance, meaning the purpose of Christianity is to get my sins forgiven so I don't go to hell. And I think it's not just people in the Christian church who feel this way. I think a lot of non-Christians have the perception that Christianity is about not going to hell and that you have to kind of be on good behavior or else get your sins forgiven somehow in order to not go to hell. And so the idea is there are rules we give God obedience to rules. Why God cares about the rules? I don't know. He's God. That's his job. And then in return, he's like, oh, you appeased my scrupulosity. So therefore I reward you with a pleasurable afterlife. And we're like this, what? How does this make right. sense of the life here and now? Like if I'm just supposed to obey arbitrary rules and so that, and not pay attention to anything else in my life now, so that one day I can be happy after I die, like, it, it feels a little bit shallow and it can lead to all these problems where you think, well, what about the longings of my heart now? What about my struggles now? What about my disappointments, my hopes and fears? Well, I just have to put that on the table and shove it because I got to obey God and do the right thing and believe the right thing so I can get to heaven. And I think, um, I think it's easy to feel that way and the way preaching sometimes talks about when it emphasizes forgiveness, 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 you're going to heaven. And we forget that there's all these other aspects to the good news of Jesus that that fill in a more comprehensive view of what Jesus is really offering, which is yes, forgiveness, yes, heaven, but a lot more than that. I, I love that you're kind of attacking the the chief article of our church because it, it, it can actually hold up against it. The, we we are supposed to talk about the forgiveness of sins one in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is that is wonderful to us. That is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. But it's actually done because God loves you. And if you you are willing to sort of narrow in on this because it it is a true thing. But if you if you ignore that one true thing at the expense of all the rest, you end up with uh, honestly a lot of the criticisms against Christianity that we have heard that are we we struggle a little bit to answer. Like um, God needs to save us from what he would do to us if we don't let him save us. And you, you end up talking about it as if it, it's um, completely divorced from a love in the first place that 
actually addresses all of those things that you just said. And in the same way, we, we talk about God's law as if it is a good thing because it is. Sin breaks stuff. It, it is true that we should sort of flee from this immorality, that, that uh, our life would just be better if there was less sin in it. But if that's all you have for Christianity is try harder to follow rules or else go to hell, uh, you again have divorced love from this entirely and, and, and the mercy of God. And while you, you sort of started with one thing that was true, you discounted the rest of God. And so uh, in, in church history ways of, of talking about justification, um, one of the ways that we talk about it is the Anselmic way from, from uh, Anselm, our father, who who talks about the, the sort of the judicial action of Christ bearing the guilt of our sins upon the cross. And that's true. But there's a lot of other ways to talk about it. There, there's the way to talk about it as if Christ simply could not let the devils stand. He could not allow for evil. And so he addresses it by conquering the devil through through the cross. Uh, there, there are other ways to talk about this that actually do also address the things we're going through now, right? Yeah, you used a word justification, which is a theological mm-hmm. word, which is, you know, the way I've heard it defined and, you know, colloquially is it's just as if I'd never sinned. Um, a more, you know, maybe theological definition is being declared righteous. So the image, like you said, is judicial. It's in a courtroom where mm-hmm. I'm the defendant before God the Father is the judge. Satan is the prosecuting attorney, and he brings up all these things that I did wrong. And Jesus is the defending attorney who comes in and says, Yeah, that's true, but I bore that penalty. And so David or Harrison is innocent in the sight of God. And that's a very powerful image. But when we, like you said, like when we take justification and divorce it from the rest of what God is doing, it can lead to this very distorted view of reality. So there are other aspects. And I really like that you said the heart of all of this, the heart of the gospel is God's love. Hmm. And I think um, there are ways we could unpack that to be a little more explicit. So one of the ways we can talk about, you know, another theological word, sanctification. And it's easy to think about sanctification. uh, Well, what do we mean by sanctification? Sanctification is the process by which the Holy Spirit makes us more like Jesus. And it's easy to think, well, that's about obeying the rules and being more of a prude. Um, You know, is Jesus a prude? I don't know. Jesus seemed to be really happy and joyful and love people. And so when you look at, um, you know, let's look at the fruit of the Spirit, because Paul, in his letters, he talks about this is the old self, this is the new self. The old self is what's drowned in baptism, what you are without God. The new self is what the Holy Spirit works in you. And when you read those lists, you're like, yeah, I don't want the old self. I want the new self, but I struggle with this old self. So what is the new self? Paul has the list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Let's start with the first three on the list, love, joy, and peace. If you were to go to a random stranger on the street and say, do you want more love in your life? What do you think they would say? Uh, I feel like I've got enough love. You know, I'm good. Thanks. Or, you know, do you think joy is a good thing? Does joy make life better? It's a no-brainer. We all want love, joy, and peace. And that's what the Holy Spirit works in us. And so... Part of this is as the Holy Spirit gives us the mind of Christ, we see things the way he does. We experience life the way Jesus does, does, which is love, joy, and peace. And that leads to a fuller life. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Not like uh, you kind of have to like siphon it off and like be disciplined and not have dessert every day, you know, but no, have it abundantly. It's, It's overflowing. And he said, if you abide in my truth, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth is not a straight jacket. It's a way to live in freedom with the way God intended us, which is good. I, I love that you're kind of talking about this in a way that, that again, it challenges sort of the, the perceptions that we take as little kids, that if you are a prude, you are following the law, and you are sad. And if you are joyful, you are, are sort of free. The law actually brings about contentment. It, it, it truly does, because it's not just a list of things you can't do, but it's it's also a list of places where we are given a great joy in, in actually fulfilling God's law to to uh, to serve our neighbor. Not that we are the fulfillers of the law, Jesus is, uh, but, but that when we lean into this thing, uh, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law and was joyful. Paul, as he talks about sanctification in the spirit, is not sort of sinning that grace would abound, but but rather actually finds a great joy in, in actually rejoicing in the gifts of God that allow him to stop measuring himself, to to stop trying to to achieve these things that Christ has already given him, and and simply to serve his neighbor as he's been given to do. 
Yeah, and you you hinted at two things there that I, I want to pull on those threads. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things you talked about is um, is trying harder, mm. and the other thing you talked about is loving our neighbor. So I want to I want to go loving our neighbor first. It can feel like a lot to love your neighbor, especially when your neighbor is unlovable. And if that's the whole point of sanctification is loving people who are unlovable, we're going to run out of gas. It's going to, mm. we're going to be, we're going to be exhausted. We can't do that. And so I think it's important to take a step back and the apostle John in his first letter says, we love because he first loved us. And I think that that is the crux of all this. That is the crux of why life with God is better than life without God. It's knowing God's love. And that's the second thing I want to get at. And Tim Keller really, really elaborates this on this really well in his book, Making Sense of God. Really recommend it. But he talks a lot about identity. Um, and, I, you know, I, talks about identity are very prevalent in our culture. And I think it's useful to talk about the message of Jesus less in terms of the judicial way. I think that was useful 50 years ago to say, I'm guilty, now I'm innocent. That's true, but I don't think it resonates with people in our culture. We can still say this is true, but I think another place to emphasize that does resonate with our culture that's equally true is to talk about identity. And Hmm. Tim Keller talks about how really identity is something where you have to get the praise or the the esteem of someone you esteem or praise. He says the praise of the praiseworthy is above all rewards. So whoever I think is succeeding or valuable or worthy of respect, I want them to think I'm succeeding and valuable or worthy of respect. And so a lot of identity, you can see this everywhere. People are trying to get to measure up to some standard to feel like I'm good enough. I'm value. I matter. And the problem is, um, Tim Keller talks about how Christianity, Jesus offers an identity that's received rather than achieved. So any other identity, you have to achieve it. And of course, Paul was doing this in the ways that were popular in his Judaic culture, you know, obeying the law, doing the rituals, doing those things. And he thought, if I do these things, then I can be good enough. In our culture, there are other things. Maybe it's um, succeeding at work. And having a good career. You know, how many times do we see, you know, Forbes publishing the 30 under 30? If you Mm -hmm. achieve something great when you're young, then you've made it and then you matter. Or maybe it's fame. You know, we see all these people trying to chase things. And the thing is, you look at the Bible and there was a guy who had all these things, fame, wealth, success, King Solomon. And he writes the book of Ecclesiastes and he says, it's pointless. He says, meaningless. It's a vapor. And I think... Mm -hmm. um, That's something where if you grow up in a Christian bubble, it's easy to deconstruct and say all the people who aren't following the rules are having such a great time. But something I found is that when you go out in life, you realize there's a lot of emptiness and a lot of the fun people are having in sin is really um, honestly self-medicating. It's trying to avoid the hurt and the emptiness mm-hmm. of life because there, there is so much hurt and there is emptiness because we live in a fallen world. And so the, the difference between, oh, there's another problem with an identity that's achieved. And that is when you place your ultimate affection in something that's less than ultimate, you strangle mm-hmm. it with your expectations. Mm-hmm. So let's say you're mm-hmm. a mom and your identity is in your kids. You're going to have so many expectations on your kids to value you as a mom and to value the things you value and to be the people, grow up into the people you want them to be. And if they don't do that, then you're going to be unhappy with yourself and you won't be able to accept it. So you're not able to love your kids as for who they are. You're loving them as a means to get what you need in your heart of hearts. It can be the same with a career or with a spouse. You make that thing the source of your identity and it can't deliver. And it's always conditional. It's always, if I meet these conditions, then I'm happy. But by putting those conditions, you don't allow that thing to thrive. You strangle it. And so the difference between these achieved identities and the identity Jesus offers is Jesus says, I love you, period. I have done everything necessary to reconcile you. We talked about justification, sanctification. There's another part, reconciliation. The idea Mm -hmm. that there's a disconnect between me and the relationship that makes life ultimately worth living, my heavenly father and Jesus, God has taken the initiative to make that right. And so I think of, you know, the passage again from 1 John, 
what see how great the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that's what we are. Or I think of what Paul says in Ephesians 2. We talk about Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 in the Lutheran Church. We love, you know, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not from yourselves, the gift of God, not by works, so no one could boast. But Ephesians 2, 10, I think, is equally packed with really good stuff. And it says, for we are God's workmanship, his masterpieces. God looks at us and says, that was a really cool thing I made. Like if you looked in the mirror every day and said, God made a good thing when he made me, how, how would that change the way you approached your day? Really and it also things. says, yeah, and it also says we are God's masterpiece created to do good works, which God created in advance. God has things for you to do to make a difference in people's lives. There's purpose to your life. There are things that you were made for that matter. And so I think this idea of an identity that's secure in Jesus, there aren't conditions, there aren't strings attached, we don't have to earn it. And God is able to handle our expectations and the deepest longings of our hearts because he put them there. I think there's something incredibly life-giving there. So it all goes back to the love of God and experiencing that and how that pales in comparison with any other source of meaning that the world can offer. You're talking about a contentment that's not just fire insurance, and uh, I, I'm starting to see it. Uh, is there anything else we should kind of know about this one? No, I, th I think there's a lot to unpack here, but but the point is, it's not yeah. just about behavior and getting to heaven. God cares about the longings of our hearts because he put them there, and he wants to fulfill them predominantly in himself, but also through all the other gifts he gives us. And eternal life starts now. It's not like eternal life starts in heaven. Eternal life starts now. The Bible talks about how if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You pass from death to life. We experience it imperfectly now because we are broken and the world is broken. But it starts now and it, we don't have to wait for it. We don't have to wait to experience God's good things. He offers them to us because he loves us. I love it. David, thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Happy to do it.